All right, hello and, and welcome everybody. My name is Michael Burroughs and I serve as director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics. And on behalf of the Institute, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this very special event, Ethics and Leadership, a conversation with Dr. Thomas Wallace. I want to begin by thanking our supporting sponsors who make this program possible. This is the Kegley family, Valley Strong Credit Union, Kaiser Permanente, and Adventist Health Bakersfield. And I also want to thank our CSUB IT team that has helped us with the technology for tonight's event. So a few words on, on just the origin of this event and the ethics and leadership series. Um, we organized this conversation with the aim of considering with an established leader, both the challenges and importance of ethical leadership. Learning directly from ethical leaders who face challenges and still lead with an ethical vision can be both enlightening and beneficial for our own careers and development as persons and leaders. And so we're very grateful that a uh, longtime leader on our campus and in our community, Dr. Thomas Wallace, has agreed to join us tonight and to share his insights and experiences. So a few notes on procedure for tonight's events, uh, tonight's event before we get started. So I have a few preset questions for Dr. Wallace that I'll ask him and we'll discuss. And following that, I will moderate a Q&A session with you, our audience. Uh, for your questions, you can submit them via the Q&A function in Zoom. And there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And no, you can submit questions at any time. Um, you don't need to wait till the end. And so if you'd like to get your question in the queue, something pops to mind that you think is interesting, feel free to um, uh, pop a question in there. And that'll, that means it'll be waiting for me when we get to that section of the event. And also, if you're a CSUB student, um, feel free to note that too. I always like to kind of highlight some questions from our, our student community um, when possible as well. So with that, um, I'm honored to introduce our guest. So Dr. Thomas Wallace is Vice President for Student Affairs at California State University Bakersfield. He is a campus and community leader and a noted lecturer and facilitator on topics such as diversity, leadership development, and student recruitment and retention. Dr. Wallace earned his PhD in educational leadership from the University of Mississippi and has received numerous awards, including the Curulis Award for Outstanding Service to Students at the University of Nebraska Omaha, the President's Award in June 2018 for Outstanding Contributions to CSUB, the Unity Award from the CSUB, CSUB Black Student Union for Contributions in Promoting Diversity and Collaboration. And he was also inducted into the University of Mississippi Distinguished Hall of Fame amongst many other awards that we wouldn't have time to list because Dr. Wallace has received many awards throughout his illustrious career. I want to know too, for more on Dr. Wallace's background and approach to leadership, I encourage you to listen to our most recent podcast on the Kegley Institute of Ethics podcast uh, called The Ethicist Corner. And that podcast is available on all major podcast platforms. And our most recent episode features a conversation with Dr. Wallace that will echo some of the themes from tonight. So with that, uh, Dr. Wallace, I wanna say thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Michael, it's an honor to be here. So I'll jump right into it. Um, Dr. Wallace, the, the topic of our conversation tonight broadly is, is ethical leadership. And I'm wondering to start, you know, who for you in your life or from afar um, has been a particularly influential exemplar of ethical leadership? Um, are there people that have kind of been examples for you that have guided your, your view of ethical leadership in your life and career? Oh, wow, there, there are many, Michael, but I, I will start with my, my grandmother, uh, by far uh, being the first to set a standard in instilling certain values uh, in us. So I'll, I'll start with my grandmother. And from there, there are so many different individuals that as I think about my own leadership style, it's an amalgamation of so many others. Uh, when I think about the universities where I've worked, I'll begin by my first stint in higher education, uh, started at the University of Mississippi as the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. And the chancellor there during that time is the individual who hired me, and that was Gerald Turner. Uh, Gerald Turner is now the president at SMU, been at SMU over 20 years now. 
but uh, I watched uh, and took note of many of the things that he did. And then uh, Chancellor Kayak followed him. Uh, I moved from there to uh, the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And there it was uh, Chancellor John Christensen. And then in coming here, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Mitchell and now Dr. Zaleski. But so many of the things I learned, I, I learned from the staff, that I work with, uh, the faculty, uh, the students, uh, and even my wife, Phyllis, I put in there as one of those leaders because uh, she's critiquing me uh, on a daily basis. And <laughs> so that, that's feedback that I get uh, often, and I look forward to that. So, Dr. Willis, you know, you, you mentioned a number of people there. This is kind of a bit of a follow-up question. I mean, are there are there qualities of, you know, some of these people, if not all of them, you know, that, that jump out at you as things that maybe throughout the course of your life, you thought, that's a quality that really seems important to me or something that, you know, if I'm going to be an effective leader or an ethical leader, th these are this is a quality that I want to try and instill in myself too. These, all the individuals that I mentioned, are conscientious, uh, they are caring, uh, they're honest, they have integrity. Uh, they're people who want to make not only you better, but they want to make uh, those around them and their contributions uh, to the places where they work and the places where they have influence, uh, all of them, uh, those are qualities that I think about that all of those individuals would possess. And, and also vision mm. and wisdom. And when I, I say wisdom rather than intelligence, uh, intelligence connotes mental capacity. But when I think about wisdom, wisdom involves uh, intent, wisdom involves action, uh, wisdom involve experiences. So when I when I think about the individual name, uh, they all possess wisdom. Mm. So and I can value that. I mean, I've trained as a philosopher, so we we like to think about wisdom and what it means to be wise. And important questions and qualities. Um, you also mentioned integrity in your response and. You know, I'm thinking this next question about the, the role of ethics in being an effective leader, right? So there's lots of qualities a leader needs to have, being able to get things done, being able to manage projects, being able to work with, with followers and collaborators. In your view, what's the role of ethics in being an effective leader? Ethics should, in guide, should guide us in everything that we do, uh, our decision-making, uh, how we interact with others, how we treat others, all of these things are, are very important. Uh, you know, I used to hear people say, do unto others as they would have you do unto to you. Well, I heard a different, I heard that put in a different way that somewhat stuck with me and that do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Hmm. And I thought, you know, there's a lot in that phrase that I had not heard it that way, but when I heard it, it makes sense because the way that I might treat myself is not the way that you would treat yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to think about each situation individually and how one is affected through not only my actions, but the actions of others. Mm. Interesting. So Dr. Wells, you know, on the session tonight, um, we have lots of students, um, young professionals, people from lots of different backgrounds. And, you know, for this question, I, I want you to imagine that you're, you're giving advice, as you've done many times before, to young aspirational leaders uh, on our campus or in our community. What, what two to three areas of advice would you give them in order to become and serve as effective and ethical leaders um, in an organization or in our community? Is there advice you could you could share for those those persons? I, I think that we need to approach uh, decision-making with an open mind. Uh, 
uh, that as you are interacting with others and you're trying to make decisions, always seek to hear from others uh, the opinions that could be different from yours. And before deriving at a decision, please engage others to help you get to that point that you can understand but also understand that there are others involved. You know, I think about uh, Gail Sayle's book, which is I Am Third, his autobiography is I Am Third. And he said that there are, are three things that we should always consider in making a decision. And he said, who is involved, who is affected, and what role do we play in both of those. Mm. And I think it's important as we are interacting with others that we think about all three of the things that Gail said listed in his book. Mm. So I want to transition here a bit. I mean, this is, I think, probably also something that I, I've, I've been asked by young leaders too in these types of sessions. And, you know, we're dealing, we're, living in challenging times right now on several fronts. And I'm wondering about, you know, with your career as a leader, can you give an example of a significant challenge or setback that you faced um, and how you, how you met that challenge, how you overcame it? I think sometimes our struggles are as important as our successes, right? Always. Uh, we need to learn from every situation that we're involved in. And sometimes it's not learning what to do. We also learn what not to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to answer your question and I'm going to take it out of the professional realm and I'm going to move it to the personal. Mm. Uh, when, my, when my mother was 55 years old, she had a heart attack and stroke. And she was in the hospital for 15 days. And she was in a coma during that 15 day period. And I have a brother, so it was the two of us that were at the hospital during that time. And so the doctors approached us and said, you know, we've had some conversations and that we think at this point uh, that we need to probably you know, take your mother off of all of the equipment. At this point, we don't see any hope in her making it. Mm. And will we consent to do that? And that, that, was, uh, that was a tough decision because we started seeking advice from her brothers and sisters. Uh, from others who were close to the family. And as you could imagine, it, it was split. And that we had some saying, it's been 15 days. What do you think is going to happen in 15 days? And at this point, why don't you just let go? Then you had others who were saying, no, no, don't do that. Uh, that's not what she would want. And so in trying to make those, that decision, my brother and I had many conversations. And finally, we decided that, okay, we're going to go against what the doctors said. Yeah. We're going to leave my mother as she is, and we're going to hope and pray that things will get better. And we were limited. We were only able to go to her room three times a day. But each time we would go, we would spend time with her. And on that 16th day, and rubbing her hand in the room, her eyes opened, and my mother actually came out of the coma wow. during that time period. While I learned a couple of things there, I learned that sometimes you've got to make a decision that goes against what even the experts say is the best thing to do. 
The other thing that I learned is that preparation is so important that I wish that we had had that conversation with my mother earlier to say, if this ever happens, what would you want us to do? They would have made that decision so much easier mm -hmm. and to the point now where for our own children, uh, Phyllis and I have taken the time to say, if this were to happen, this is what we want you to do. So they don't have that burden of trying to figure out, well, what would mom want? What would dad want? They know. Mm -hmm. So those were some lessons learned through a very difficult situation. Thanks for sharing that, Dr. Wells. I mean, the personal story and super powerful. Um, very much appreciate that. And um, you know, something we haven't really talked about directly yet um, is you know, use the term leadership quite a bit, but you, know, you can't really have a leader unless you have followers, right? People who are gonna be with and behind or maybe even in front of the leader sometimes, right? You know, you're a person who has been a leader in major educational organizations, work with community groups, um, you know, all kinds of different um, aspects of leadership. And uh, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about how you kind of effectively build successful collaborations um, with large groups of people to achieve goals and actions, right? I mean, you can have the best ideas and vision in the world, but if nobody understands them or buys into them, you know, nothing might come from it, right? So how do you look at that when you're trying to develop a project and achieve a substantive end and you want to bring a large group of people together? I mean, how does that work for you? How do you think about that process? I think you begin with the end in mind, as Covey would say. And then you began to gain input from others to help you in deriving at that decision. But don't go into a situation like that trying to dictate what should be done. The best ideas and projects that I've been successful with, I've gone into it thinking one thing and I've come out of it with a different product but that product was a better product because I was seeking input from those who looked at it probably differently than I did. And through that process of allowing voices at the table, but also with those voices, remember what's taking place. These are stakeholders and you want them to have ownership but if they're not involved in the decision-making, how can you expect them to take ownership? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you want them at the table, you want them to be contributors and you want us to work together to come, come together for the end product. That end product is always a better product when you have a number of people at the table working together. Yeah, yeah. So Douglas, just a follow-up question here. I mean, how do you balance achieving that end, right? Which, and sometimes there's time constraints on achieving an end, right? Or, or resource constraints with that approach of having multiple stakeholders at the table. And not that those are necessarily in opposition all the time, certainly not. Sometimes they're, that it actually helps achieve that end. But sometimes also it might be, you feel like you need to take decisive action in certain situations that maybe runs against some of those voices. I mean, how do you, have you ever had a situation where it was kind of difficult to balance that, like achieving the goal and also being as inclusive, inclusive as possible with the stakeholders at the table? Have you, how, how do you think about that? Well, well, Michael, leadership is situational. And as you think about the characteristics of a leader, and you look at different situations, it calls on us to employ different things at different times. Mm -hmm. And there are times when you've got to come uh, forward with a quick decision as you stated. Well, that might not be the time where you can involve as many as you would like to. 
you, you have to make decisions based on the situation. Mm -hmm. Also, I also rely on what I call the Kenny Rogers uh, School of Leadership. <laughs> and that is you got to know when to hold them, when to fold them, when to walk away and when to run. Yeah. And you're going to do some of all of that depending on the situation. I like that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to remember that one. Uh, Dr. Wallace, uh, I want to ask, so actually I want to pause here for a moment for those who came in late too. Uh, there's a QA and a icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Don't be shy about putting a question in the queue and we'll transition to that soon. And I'd be happy to ask, uh, ask your questions uh, to Dr. Wallace. So please feel free to enter questions as you see fit um, to our audience. I wanted to ask you about a, if you have, I'm sure you have many, but a, a favorite book or documentary or movie um, that has been useful for you in reflecting on leadership in your own life. Are there some resources that have been impactful for you and that you'd be willing to recommend to others on the on the uh, Zoom webinar tonight? Well, there are so many to recommend. I, I will name a few, but uh, over my lifetime, you've got to remember, this is my 42nd year in education. And so I, I've had so many, but let me begin with Stephen, H Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm. Uh, that's a good one to begin with. Uh, the Energy Bus by John Gordon, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist uh, by Ibram Kendi, uh, Differential Management by James Payne, uh, Days of Grace uh, by Arthur Ashe, and probably one that uh, we sometimes when we're asked this question that we leave out and it probably covers the scope of any and everything that we might want to know. And that's, uh, that's the Holy Bible. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to transition here to, um, to our questions uh, in a moment. So while I'm doing that, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A uh, uh, function there. You know, one thing that struck me about Dr. Wallace, I, so I've been at CCB for four years and I've been fortunate enough to work with Dr. Wallace on a few different events and initiatives. And, and one of those was a summer program that um, we were doing for young boys of color um, uh, in terms of bringing them to CCB, uh, talking about leadership, talking about ethics, um, and kind of giving them an immersive educational experience on our campus, local students, young students. And we were going to a basketball game and I remember we, uh, with, with the kids at CSUB and I remember we were walking through the parking lot and talking and there was some trash on the ground. And I remember you, you bent down and you picked it up. You didn't just walk past it and you put it into a trash can and we kept walking. And that for you was probably an everyday thing. But for me, that, that actually struck me. You know, you're a high ranked person in the university. You work on lots of major initiatives, but you also attend to the small things, right? And you're not gonna ask anybody to do something that you won't do. And I thought that was just characteristic of who you are as a leader and a person in my eyes. So I just wanted to share that story, simple story, but one that for me was, I still remember that was impactful. Thank you. So we do have a few questions here, uh, Dr. Wallace. Um, the first comes from uh, Tamar, Anthony. And Tamar uh, asks, uh, Dr. Wallace, how old were you when you had to make the decision about your mom and learn those tough lessons? My mom was 55 at the time. Uh, and so that would kind of tell you my age, but yes, she was, she was 55 years old. She was young and uh, she went on to live uh, another eight years after that. And so my, my children all got a chance to see and know granny as they called her. Thanks for that question, Tamar. Uh, Dr. Wallace, um, Dr. Deborah Jackson asks, can you share with us your thoughts on how to inspire and support young black men to become ethical leaders, particularly in the face of the obstacles they may face due to racial discrimination? That's a, that's a, a tough one, but let me begin by saying, by modeling 
that behavior that we would expect of them. Uh, so many times it, it's do as I say and not as I do. And it's very important to me that as others see what I do, it's something that hopefully they would want to emulate and to, to know and understand the importance of ethical leadership, as, as Michael calls it. What are we doing that others would want to be a part of? I, I always ask, and in several workshops I've been in with groups uh, that are trying to attract others to be a part of it, Usually the first question I ask is, what are you doing that would call someone to say, I want to be a part of what you are a part of? Mm. And generally, we want to be a part of something where the people who are involved in that are doing the right thing. They're modeling in a way that others say, I'd like to, to be like him. I think also teaching our young men to understand the value of working, but working together and know that collaboration and what we do will make a difference. You know, there's an African proverb that says, when two African, when two elephants fight, it's the grass underneath that suffers. So you, you think about what's happening right now and the challenges that we have. When you look at it, it's not just the pandemic. The pandemic alone, that one challenge is enough to bring all of us down. But there are two other major challenges that we're dealing with as a society to go along with what we're dealing with with the pandemic. Let's, let's put in what we're dealing with, with social justice. Uh, then a third one would be, let's look at the political climate right now. So put those three together. And right now as a society, we've got a triple threat. If we were in basketball, they got a move that they call the triple threat. We've got a triple threat right now that we're dealing with. So it's not just one thing, put in the other two to go with that. And right now we're being challenged as a society with all three of these. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. So we have a, there's a question here from uh, Darius Riggins and one from Crystal and they actually kind of overlap a bit. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of merge them together here. Um, so Darius writes, he, you have said that leadership is situational. Uh, can you describe a situation where you had to make a job related leadership call that went against what your team or department area recommended? And what was the outcome? Or would you not take that approach regardless of the situation? There have been times Darius when I've taken that approach. Uh, it's not one that, that I'm comfortable. It's not one that I prefer. But yes, there have been times when I've had to make decisions that did not go along with what the others thought was the best decision. But what I always try to do is let them know and understand that I'm making that decision based on whatever the things are that I'm going to list for them to know that I didn't do it because I was in a position that I could. You know, too many times, and, and I think that comes back to the respect that I might have for them, and in turn, the respect that they have for me, because they know that's not my normal mode of operation. So I think that comes into play is what is the relationship that you have with those that you're working with, that they know you're not making that decision because you can. 
Dr. Wallace, um, this is a related question, but maybe a little bit different. Um, uh, Crystal asks, how do you address conflict among stakeholders? So if you're working with numerous people and there's, there's conflict between them, are there strategies you have for, for addressing that, those conflicts in your leadership style? Yes. First of all, we're going to identify what's causing the conflict. I think too many times we allow things to fester and we don't want to deal with them when they're smaller and they become bigger and tougher to deal with. I think all of those who, those who work with me will tell you during the evaluation that I have with them is something that's very important to me that I first explain to them this is a formal evaluation and I'm doing it because we're required to do it. But I evaluate you 24 seven, 365 days a year. That's what the evaluation is. And I'm always giving feedback. And then I ask them, I say, is there anything that you've heard during this evaluation that you haven't already heard from me? I think it's important to give feedback all the time. And I don't need a form in order for me to give that feedback. I'm going to give that feedback to you because I care about you as a person, but I care about the organization as well. In order for us to grow and be better, we need to look at every day the opportunity to get better. And we can only do that if we're open and honest and respectful with one another. Dr. Wallace, uh, Dr. James Rodriguez um, writes with a question and he says, could you reflect on the notion of servant leadership and the opportunities and challenges to such leadership in contemporary society? Um, if possible, could you focus on challenges and opportunities for servant leadership in higher education today? Sure. It's, it's one of those, and Dr. Rodriguez is, is very much familiar with that we're sometimes asking individuals to do things. And those individuals are going to ask, are you willing to do it yourself? And sometimes there are no rewards associated with this, but we know it's to help for the greater good. And we're doing these things. You, you mentioned me picking up trash. There's nothing in my job description that says I need to pick up trash. Mm -hmm. But I know if I do that, we're going to have a cleaner campus that is going to make a difference in how it looks. It could even make the difference in a student deciding if he or she wants to come to CSUB based on how our campus looks. But the other thing that happens with that is it's contagious. I, I see others now that are walking the campus. I'm not the only one that's picking up trash. Mm -hmm. They don't mind picking up trash. So there are rewards associated with that, but you've got to ask, what is the intent? I always bring most of the things that I'm working with and dealing with back to intent. What is the intent? My intent there is for us to have a cleaner campus. My in intent is not for you to look at me as you did and say, he's picking up trash. I didn't do that for Michael. I did that for our campus. That was my intent is for us to have a better campus. So sometimes we lose focus on why we're doing things and we need to ask ourselves more, what is the intent? Mm, yeah. So uh, Dr. Wallace, this question comes from uh, our athletic director, director Ziggy Siegfried. Uh, so during your time at Ole Miss, um, I know the university was working to enhance their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are some of the ways you and others transformed the culture at Ole Miss? Um, how did that impact the Oxford community? 
Wow. Well, you've got to understand it was a lot of work to be done uh, to begin with. And we had to make sure we built a coalition of individuals from different races, different ages, different genders, and bring all of the stakeholders to the table and ask ourselves some tough questions in making decisions. And there are some things that had transpired on the Ole Miss campus that we were not proud of. And we had to say we were not proud of that. But more importantly, what can we do to maybe prevent those from happening again? What are the things that we can do in coming together? And so we had to build a coalition and that coalition grew. You had others come on board. You had the community that decided that they wanted to be a part of that. My directors and AVPs know one of the things that I say to them about collaborations is that we want our tentacles all over the campus. We wanna reach out to others. We don't want to be in that capsule that is student affairs. We want to be a part of the campus, the bigger whole, and to see the results of people working together for a common cause. That's what we were able to do at Ole Miss. That's how we were able to increase black faculty and staff, increase the number of students who were attending. But you have to make some tough decisions and you have to be intentional at where you're trying to go and what you're trying to do. And know that not everyone's going to be happy with those decisions that you make, but you've got the core working together because we know we all will benefit. And sometimes we don't see those benefits immediately, but if we understand delayed gratification, and to know that that will come, sometimes not on our timetable, but it will come in due time. It appears we had a technical problem with uh, Michael's connection. Maybe I said something Michael didn't like. I don't think that was it. Um, I'm going to see if he's, uh, he's definitely not with us right now. Let's see if we can get him back. We'll give him a little more time here to uh, log back in. He might have had a technical problem. I'm going to go ahead. I, I see one of the questions says, what is your favorite leadership project at CSUV. Uh, 
I'm not sure I have a favorite, but I will tell you one that I got engaged in early when I arrived here. Uh, when I arrived, I saw a beautiful campus. Uh, I, I saw a campus that had the potential to do some really good things, but I was bothered by the amount of trash that I saw on the campus. And so I just sent out an email asking if it's anyone who's interested in serving on a committee uh, to please show up. And we had probably 35 individuals show up for that first meeting. And those 35 individuals were committed to making our campus a, a beautiful campus. And we were able to work together uh, to get that done. And now, as you know, we have others who are talking about how were you able to do that? Well, we did it by working together. And now to be only one of two campuses in America that have the designation of Keep America Beautiful. There are only two college campuses that obtained that during the time where we had that designation. Welcome back, Michael. Thank you. So I had a slight technical difficulty there, but we're back. Uh, so, and I see some questions in the queue here. So um, we have one from uh, Ana Santos here. Uh, and Ana asked, uh, Dr. Wallace, thank you for sharing your time with us tonight. Um, how do you decide when to go against an expert's advice? Well, you have to look at a number of factors. Anna, you know, one is uh, why am I going against that advice? Uh, what is the end result? And remember, I use the word intent. What is the intent? And what is that individual's intent as opposed to what yours might be? And then I look at what would the results, short term and long term, be in making those decisions. And then we try to spend time talking about why we might differ in opinion on something. And then we derive at the direction that we want to go. So Dr. Wells, we have a question here from uh, Francisco Perez. Um, how do I create an ethical culture in my classroom? Um, what are some things that you would uh, or what are some tools you would use to help develop an ethical culture in a classroom with students? Well, you, you have a nice uh, guide that you actually can use when you look at the CSUB's guiding principles. If you look at those and you go through each one, that will create an environment if you can get others to adhere to those guiding principles. And if they can buy into that, that's a a great starting point. There was uh, Mark Mays asked, um, as one of the leaders of our university and all of the responsibilities and demands that come with that, how do you balance your work and life responsibilities? It can be difficult sometimes, uh, but I, I try to balance it in a way that it's important that I keep my mental health as well as my physical health as top priority. Uh, sometimes I'm, I'm walking and doing other things all at the same time, uh, but I try to balance it because I, I enjoy sporting events. And during those sporting events, I have a chance to interact with others. And sometimes we're even getting business done during those interactions. So luckily, I'm someone who enjoys sports, and athletics is one of those units reporting to me. So I'm able to get a number of things done through my interactions with those in that area. So Dr. Wilson, we have a lot of questions here. We're going to get to all of them tonight, but I want to ask a, a few more before we close out. Um, so Heflin asks, what has been the most challenging thing you've had to face as a leader at CSUB during this pandemic? And what's your favorite thing that you've learned throughout this time? 
my most challenging thing is not being able to interact uh, with those that I work with and being on the campus and being with students and faculty and staff. Uh, I, I draw energy from being around others and not being able to do that is very difficult. But also, and, and I like the second part of that question because I've talked to others about this as we look at this situation. What are some of the things that we learned about ourselves? What have we learned about others? And when I think about that, I think about how we answered the challenge of being able to communicate in a way that many of us thought we could not, but we found a way, we, we found a way to communicate that we will now be able to use in moving forward, that it gives us another tool. So even through these tough times, there are things that we've learned not only about ourselves, but we've learned about others also. So, uh, Dr. Walsh, I just want to share a comment here from uh, President Zelezny that, that just came in. So, outstanding presentation, great for every day to serve with Dr. Wallace at CSUB, a compassionate servant leader who makes a powerful, positive impact every day. Thanks for putting CSUB on the map, Dr. Wallace. You are an inspiration. Just so wanted to share that, that comment from our president, Dr. Zelezny. Thanks. She's, she's very kind. So, Dr. Wallace, this question comes from Ukechi. And if I'm mispronouncing that, please forgive me. Um, she notes that it's a pleasure to hear you speak and thanks you for, for being here tonight. The question uh, is when it comes to decision-making, what is your advice for emerging leaders when they face a conflict for the first time while trying to find a resolution on a discussion that is being made as a group? First of all, what created the controversy? You, you gotta, ask yourself that. Sometimes we are defending things and we don't even know what we're defending. There are individuals that are upset about something and we don't even take the time to ask, what is it that you're upset about? We, we assume that they're upset about something and it might not be what we think. So I, a beginning point is simply to say, what is it that we're disagreeing on. And if you can establish that first, that gives you a starting point to try to gain a resolution. But your beginning point is, what is it that we're disagreeing on? That's your beginning point. Mm -hmm. So there's a previous question in the queue, uh, Dr. Wallace, about leading a person who is unethical. Um, and I wonder, you can interpret this as you, as, as you see fit, but there's a question about, you know, how do you lead somebody who maybe is not committed to ethics um, or integrity or does not seem to be? Um, are there just lines that you think can't be crossed in those situations or have you, how would you approach that as a leader? I'm not sure that individual knows, but they answered the question, I said, how do you lead them? Obviously, you're not leading them. Uh, if they're unethical, you can't relegate yourself to do something that is unethical. So I don't think you've got to look at this as how you're leading. That individual obviously does not want you to lead them if they're asking you to do something that is unethical. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So Dr. Wells, we'll close out with uh, this one. Sorry, folks, we can't get to all the questions tonight, but we've gotten to quite a few. Um, uh, Lorenzo asked, uh, as a new or young professional, do you recommend an individual seek a doctoral degree or gain more experience working within their specific field um, as they develop as a leader? I think you can do both, Lorenzo. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm proof that you can. Uh, during the time that I got my doctorate, uh, I was working uh, during that time. I had a wife and three children. 
and I was involved in other organizations. So uh, let, me, let me maybe set the standard for you to say that if you want to do it, you can do it. And there is no one definite way uh, when individuals say, well, I did it like this, or I went through and did this and I quit my job and I went full time and I got my doctorate. Those individuals made their decisions based on their own circumstances. You've got to look at yours and for you, what is best for you? Is it better that you go full time and get your doctorate or do you feel you need to stop working? Sometimes the circumstances around why we make those decisions, they're different for each of us. So you've got to look at that and weigh it in your own way based on your own circumstances. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. And as we come to the conclusion here, um, I just wonder, I know we've talked about a lot of questions tonight. Um, are there any final comments you'd like to share with, uh, with the audience tonight before we, before we close out? You know, Michael, I, I am honored to, to be here and you're asking me to be a part of this. There's so many individuals on our campus uh, who is more worthy of this certainly than I am. And so I am honored that you asked me uh, to be here and to be a part of this. Uh, and I am proud to be at CSUB. And as, as I see, we continue to grow in the things that we're doing and providing quality academic instruction and programs and services for our students. We all play a vital role in that. And regardless of what you're doing or I'm doing, if we're all working in a direction that we're trying to help our students to be successful citizens in society by providing them the tools that they need in order to be successful, we can approach that in many different ways. Uh, we don't have to approach it all in the same way. Uh, your contributions to someone being successful may be a little different from mine. Your approach could be different from mine, but I'm gonna bring you back to that one word that you heard me use many times today. And that word is intent. What, what is your intent? And if your intent is honorable, if your intent is to help our students, then we can get there. And we don't have to go with a cookie cutter model to do it. We can do it in many different ways but at the end of the day, are you, as well as me, as well as others, doing what we can to help our students be successful? And that's what it really comes down to. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Um, it's been an honor having you as part of this program and working alongside you during my time at CSUB. And I really appreciate you sharing your time and, and insight with us tonight. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, and have a good evening. You too. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you at the, the next event. Um, and uh, thank you for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Take care.